Oregon State heads to Washington State in search of its first Pac-12 win. One coach puts the players on notice and another one has a particularly close connection to one of the Cougars star players. We'll have it all coming up starting right now on hashtag Beavers football. Oregon State's next game this time at the Blues. Washington State tomorrow trying to recover from last week at Arizona. Welcome to Hashtag Beavers Football. I'm Katie Brown along with Slade Norris and Nigel Burton, two of the best in the business. So send them your toughest questions. Send them your toughest questions because we want you to be part of the show too. Hashtag Beavers FB. Anything. It can be from what you saw last week, what needs to change. They have all the answers. All right, we rewind Arizona last week, and I don't think we need to rehash a whole lot to. of it. I think the one thing coming out of that is when you have a performance like that, do you just put it to the side and move on, or do you bury your players' faces in it to try and get them to uh, learn from it? <laughs> well, I'm glad my kids aren't coached by you. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> you know, I, I think, honestly, when it comes down to it, you really don't do either. What you want to do is you want to make sure you correct any mistakes that you saw, and there's obviously a lot from that kind of a loss. And then move. Then you do have to move on. Uh, you don't want to rub their noses in it because next thing you know what you can do is that end up killing their confidence. You know, they still feel like they can play with people. I think what you want to do is say, listen, if we fix this, if we fix X, Y, and Z, we'll find ourselves in a game in the fourth quarter, and we've prepared ourselves to be tough enough to be able to finish games. And so uh, fix what you need to fix and move on. We had a game like this my senior year. A lot of people remember it. It was the uh, the old Oregon game when we missed out on going to the Rose Bowl. And as a team, we didn't even watch the film. Uh, we knew we were playing. We we're going to play Pittsburgh in the in the bowl game, and different offense. So what's the point of going back there and seeing something again that you feel so ashamed about? We knew what we did wrong. Yeah, uh, that's a, that one was a little different. I think for two reasons. One, that was going into a bowl game where you're going to have a month to prepare. So really, it's one of those like you can try. It almost feels like a, a second season. That's true. That's true. And the other thing is, you guys are really se senior laden team. So there was no like, hey, by the way, you me you messed up the smash corner route and cover four, like, duh. Like, we know that. Yeah. As opposed to this team is really young, and there are some things that there's going to be some guys who are on the field that really don't know exactly what they did wrong. And so they, they need to see it. But like I said, we don't want to we don't want to you know pull a Katie and rub their nose in. No, I didn't say I would. I'm kidding. I'm, kidding. I'm joking. I, I'm joking. I think the thing that's so frustrating for fans is you know we had we've seen glimpses first half against Stanford, opening drive at Michigan. You know we've seen where they're composed and then but they just it's just consistency. I mean our our defense straight from the beginning of the game we played great defense for two downs then that third and long down we give up a huge gain once again two downs the third and long. It's, that's how their entire season has gone so far, and that's youth, and it will change, and it will get better, uh, but that's what we're dealing with right now. Yeah, you've got a six-year-old, right? <laughs> right? You have a six-year-old. I do. Okay. How different do you think? Very mature. How? Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, wait till she's 11, right? You're going to be real mature then. <laughs> so it's no different now. They're a lot, they've got a lot of 18-year-olds running around that place. Yeah. And they're when learning. they're 22, 23, they're a lot different. And so at 18, they've got to kind of work through some kinks, and it's very new to them. And so, that, you know, there's, there's going to be days like this. And I, I lived through them when I had two of the, probably the best corners, at least the best tandem of corners ever come through that place. And Keenan Lewis and Brandon, you know, and Brandon Hughes, their freshman year, they were the worst I secondary remember that. in I the country. I remember that. I remember t <laughs> telling Riles, like, just calm, it, relax, they'll be fine. We threw Coy Francis in. You added Gerard Lawson, and by their third year, they were the best, if not in the Pac-12, but in the country. country. We were so lucky to have them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. All right. Well, it is time for the Toyota interview. Toyota, let's go places. And in this edition, Kalani Sataki, the, def the defensive coordinator, says it's time for guys to start playing or get ready to sit. <laughs> I think scheme-wise, I I, we can't go any simpler than what we're doing as a defense. Otherwise, we're sacrificing a lot of what we can do to help us be successful as a team. And so um, we can't dummy it down anymore, you know, and can't get any more simple. So uh, either two things, I, and everybody's, it's all, it's all, it's a different, um, can't be like a general and say, okay, this is our issue. It's all specific to each position group, but um, there's two ways to fix it. Either you eliminate people from, from making mistakes or you make sure that they don't do, do the mistakes. And eventually, uh, you know, in some cases, going to have to be eliminating some guys from playing. In other guys, in other cases, we're going to have to get guys to be a lot cleaner and um, make sure that the, that everything matters for them to do their job. Um, 
I don't know what else could be more um, of a teaching moment than seeing what we've done in the last in the games that we've lost, how, how poorly we played technique-wise and and uh, and even fundamentals. But more than anything, I just guys not being in the right spot. That's that's we got to fix that, and, and um, coaches will fix it. Calls it like he sees it, and Matthew Boyd writes in, how important a win is this for the hashtag Beavers football? And you're smirking, Nigel. Oh, they're all important. Right? <laughs> Everyone. I mean, Herm, Herm Edwards, you play to win <laughs> the game. I mean, honestly, you, you work 353 days a year for 12 guaranteed opportunities. So they're all important, especially for a young team. So. Well, let's take a look at the especially schedule there. Especially these next two. I mean, <laughs> the next two games, that's our really best shot to win. And then you look at the rest of it, if they want to go to a bowl game, they're going to have to steal two the rest of the way down. It's, it's, it gets tougher and tougher as the season goes along. Yes, the uh, next three, especially Utah, UCLA, California. So you're right, they are going to have to get it in the next two wins to get things going. All right, well, of course, it is mostly football during the football season, but a moment this week where we take a time out to... Uh, you know, remember the things that are important in life. And the Beavers taking a field trip this week, actually coming from Corvallis up to Portland to pay a visit to Randall's Children's Hospital at Legacy in Portland. Part of OSU's Everyday Champions program, really big with Coach Anderson. And you can see there uh, several of the players coming, Storm Woods, Larry Scott, Ryan Null, Caleb Smith among them. And Coach, during the season, you wouldn't expect maybe to see that during the season, but why is it so important for the guys to get out and do this kind of thing? Well, during the season, it's a great thing because it's a break. I mean, you're on this, you know, 15 to 17 week grind of football, 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 even when they're in, you know, when they're not in class, they're doing football. And so this is a great chance for them to break away and, and kind of refresh themselves and, and really, you know, what's important. And, and really, you know, if you think about it as a parent, you know, your your day to day of just trying to get your kids out the door, get to school, get them home, do their homework, make sure they haven't done anything dumb, and then put them to bed. And so it's one of those things where, you know, you don't get a, a chance a lot of times to expose your kids to community service events. So for a lot of these kids, it's their first time getting out and doing something and learning how important it is and how gratifying it is to do something with your community. So that's, you know, that's kind of the, the role we take as coaches is to expose our players to things outside of their comfort zone, or outside of things that they're used to. We did that when I was there. We did it uh, when I was on the Raiders. And it's, it's an awesome feeling watching those kids' faces completely light up. They don't care if you're the starting quarterback or you haven't played a snap. They're just excited that you're there in a jersey and you're, you're there to see them. And they're going through some tough things. But uh, it's really inspiring how strong they are. And it makes you want to go out and play even harder. And it's also a reminder that you're constantly being watched so many people look up to you and so as a player you need to conduct yourself accordingly and I love uh, the coaches doing this and I like the timing of it and everything sometimes you can get stuck in that and think it's just you get it's all about football and then you realize there's a larger picture of life there and people especially who, after a loss like this yeah, exactly I mean, lift a, you up yeah there's those times and you're like geez how you know and it's like you know what there's a lot bigger things out yep. there that are way more crucial than this Arizona loss. I'll, we'll be fine. We'll move on. It'll be okay. All right. Okay. Well, we're just getting started here on hashtag Beavers Football. So, again, send in your tweets. We will answer them. But coming up on the show later on, Coach Anderson reflects on his relationship with Washington State's quarterback. When Luke was 17 years old, I probably should have just locked him up in my basement then and it wouldn't have had a problem. But then my boys wouldn't have won a state championship when he was the quarterback for them and do the things that they all did or the great success they had. He's a great kid. I love him. The coach will talk more about Luke Falk and what can Oregon State learn from Oregon's loss to Washington State last weekend? Washington State comes into the game against Oregon State on a high after what happened at Austin Stadium last weekend. Of course, the double overtime game. The Cougs score. The Ducks try to match it. And instead, it is game on this throw right here after opening up the season with a loss at home to Portland State. And then now a win at Oregon. What a wild start to the season for this team. And, uh, well, they put this in. The Oregon Trail, a reference here. You have died of dysentery. <laughs> That's a bad way to go. Okay. I mean, they they could have chose, like, snake bite or something, but no. <laughs> and Ice Cold Chef says in the tweet, what can Beavers learn from the Ducks' loss against the Cougs? Anything translate? I think go off your Burton breakdown. I mean, you can't let them be 50-50. No, I mean, yeah, you can't let them run. Uh, you can run, uh, obviously, against 
uh, U of O and, and really Washington State for that matter. And, uh, you know, the one thing that is pretty unique, I think, about this Washington State team is how mentally tough they are. If you think about they were down 10 multiple times in that game at Autzen. Every other team that I can think of in Wa at Washington State, at least recently, would have folded the 10, been like, okay, we're going to lose by 31, we're done. Look at the pass yards for Washington State and the rushing yards for Oregon. Yeah, I mean, it was <laughs> insane. So, I mean, but here's the thing about that that rush yard uh, category stat for Washington State is deceiving because Luke Falk had minus 49 yards rushing okay. by himself. So really, Washington State had 19 carries for 185 yards. Wow. And so they averaged almost 10 yards a carry. So they want to run the football. And so, you know, there's all those things to take away from it. Really, the thing to me is that if Oregon State finds themselves ahead, and they better not play like young guys because this Washington State team will not quit. If you look at even the Rutgers game, they were down on the road. They kept fighting. They kept playing. So it's going to be a 60-minute battle, no doubt. And a little change in the defense this year. Of course, there's always so much talk about the offense with Mike Leach, but uh, a new face there on, on defense and Alex Grinch who just first season after spending the last three years at Missouri as a safeties coach. And uh, so things making his mark on Washington State's program. Uh, he was the MVP probably even more than Luke Falk was when you consider the fact that, you know, before he was at Missouri, he was at New Hampshire with Chip Kelly. He knows that offense, you know, uh, uh, backwards, forwards, and in between. And so, uh, you know, that was probably their best defensive day they've had against Oregon in terms of keeping them out of the end zone. In a long time, and uh, I think he was the key to a lot of that. And a lot of that's turnovers too. He's got to be preaching that so much. They've already got nine, and I think they had eight all last year so far. So uh, that's been key to their being able to keep those points down. And I got a chance to watch these guys in fall camp, and in terms of the kind of guys they have running, I mean, they got dudes. I mean, they are big, they are fast. They got guys. <laughs> they got dudes. They don't they have, have, boys. have dudes. They have dudes. They, know, they have dudes. <laughs> now, the one thing that kind of surprised me is in the secondary, they're not very big. They're still kind of figuring things out there. But when you look at their defensive line and their linebacker, I mean, you know, Jeremiah Allison, I mean, here's a guy who got into Harvard and Yale and turned it down to go to Wazoo, which I'm not sure it shows exactly how smart he <laughs> is, but, but this is true. He really did. Uh, but, I mean, they, they are a physical front, and when you watch them practice, they, didn't get, they were in shells the day I was there, and you would have thought it was a full padded scrimmage. Uh, and so... Uh, you know, they're getting a lot of play out of their defense. I like Allison, too. He's a guy that's all over the field. I mean, you turn on tape, and he's always that guy that's within five yards of the ball at all times, you know, so he's a fun guy to watch play. Yeah. All right. Well, it'll be interesting when you have a team that's coming off such a lopsided loss and a team coming off such an emotional win, how those emotions, if at all, carry over to the next week. Uh, we'll see. I mean, it's all about your, your maturity level. I, I know, you know, Slade, when we beat SC that one year, you know, I always bring this up. This is one of my favorite stories was getting in that locker room. Everybody's excited. The president's in the locker room. And the first thing out of Alan Darlin's mouth was, we better take care of Arizona State or people will think this was a fluke. And, you know, if, you know, and we had a mature team that year. If Washington State is a mature football team, that should be the first thing out of their mouths when they were in that locker room celebrating that win is, we better make sure we take care of Oregon State or people will think we're just a fly-by-night team. And so we'll, we'll see. You know, we'll see what happens. I'm glad you mentioned Darlin. We were lucky when I was going through to have leaders like that, whether it was Bill Swancutt or, or Alan Darlin or all, a ton of seniors in my class. And that's something I think that we're taking a step back with since I've left is we haven't had real prominent leaders. We had a couple in those successful seasons. We had like Poyer was a great guy, Cooks, obviously. But uh, we've been missing that a little bit. Yeah. All right. OK, well. Still to come, we have a whole lot more, and of course we'll uh, take a look at uh, the uh, Steve Sarkeesian and Steve Spurrier situations for this week later on in the show. But right now, it is time for Slade to show us the latest in Beaver fashion. Cool. I'm downtown Portland at the OSU Beaver store off of Southwest 6th and Alder. And guys, it's game day apparel today. Come visit us at one of our three satellite locations, here, Kaiser Station, and also Clackamas Town Center. It feels great to have an OSU jersey on again, so come down and pick up yours. We have three different choices, quarterback, wide receiver, running back, and the best part about this, guys, we've got the coach wear today. Check out these polos. This is what they wear on the sidelines. And if you want to channel your inner Gary Anderson, you got to get a visor. Come here, guys. Get your beaver gear. OSU Beaver Store. Fans start here. 
Yeah, well, Luke, I probably just, uh, when Luke was 17 years old, I probably should have just locked him up in my basement then and it wouldn't have had a problem. But then my boys wouldn't have won a state championship when he was the quarterback for them and do the things that they all did or the great success they had. He's a great kid. I love him. Um, obviously, he's from Logan, went to high school with my boys, and, and uh, he comes from a tremendous family. And he's fought to get where he is. He's a great story. I don't know how much you guys know about his story, but you should look into it and understand where it is because nobody gave him a chance. And he, uh, he's a self-made guy, and Coach Leach gave him an opportunity, and, boy, has he made the best of that opportunity. So I think the biggest thing for Luke, as I look at him, is how he's handling the pressure, the blitzes, and some things that are coming out and getting the ball out, and he's, he's well coached. So he's, he's been in that system for a while. We have to surprise him and, and try to, uh, you know, make him uncomfortable. That's obviously part of the recipe that we're going to have to have to have success. A lot of respect there toward the quarterback for Washington State after the relationship there playing high school ball with his boys. Alex writes in, Luke Falk dominated us last year. Should we expect the same on Saturday? You know, I, I remember I remember sitting here a year ago when he was going to be starting for the first time the next day, and we were like, oh, new quarterback, first time. He's at Reader Stadium, going to, you know, going to get to him and look at five touchdowns, 471 passing yards, 164 quarterbacks quarterback rating still the highest of his career he just came on and announced himself that's for sure uh, that's kind of the beauty of their system I mean honestly I remember watching uh, you know coach Leach and uh, it, the idea is and, and it's a great idea it, we use it a lot of times defensively is don't do too much and make sure your guys know it forwards and backwards in such a way that they don't make mental mistakes so if we don't make mistakes and then they're they, they don't really run offense they learn defense every week so their thing is to learn what the defense is trying to do to them and how they adjust routes and things on the fly. So no matter what you're in, you're always wrong. And so uh, it works. And when you think about it, the, the best is they ask Coach Leach, well, what do you call this play? He said, we call it play four. He says, well, what about the previous play? Play three. <laughs> they had six plays that they ran in one game. Just six different plays. That's it. So that allows a guy like Luke Falk to step in who hadn't played before and have success immediately because they're not doing, you know, they're not doing the Jeff Tedford where they run 250 plays and confuse a guy and he ends up throwing five picks. They run four, five, six things that he's comfortable with and allows them to adjust. We had Alex Brink on the, on the show talking Beaver yeah. this week, and I mean, just exactly what you were saying. He was saying how he's given the keys to Luke, and that's how he does it to his quarterbacks. And he goes through and he says, "Look, I'll call the formation," and then Alex, or I mean Alex, and then Luke goes out there and Luke calls the play based on what the defense gives him. And so, it, like you said, it makes things real simple. It gives him the power to change the defense, uh, the offense to what the defense gives him. You, you know, Katie, the thing too that is unique about him is quarterbacks are greedy dudes. Like, if Joey was here, I would say it to his face. If Joey Harrington was here, I'd be like, you are greedy, okay? All quarterbacks became quarterbacks because they love throwing a long ball. They love throwing fades and posts and corner routes. Luke Falk is one of those rare guys who really doesn't make a lot of mistakes because he's patient. And that's why you saw the number of interceptions that Washington State quarterbacks have thrown. And, of course, the name of the last quarterback escapes me. But, you know, he threw a ton of picks because he got greedy and was always trying to find, you know, as opposed to Luke really dissected the U of O defense by just taking what they gave him. He would dump it, dump it, dump it. When they gave him the opportunity to throw it deep, he would. He didn't make a lot of mistakes, and he absolutely destroyed them. And that's pretty unique for quarterbacks. And obviously Gabe Marks leads, leads their receiving core. But one of the interesting things about them is although they're so known for their offense and they put up these huge offensive numbers, they don't do long balls, generally speaking. But they don't think they have a pass play over 40 yards this year. I mean, they... Uh, yeah, you know, it, it, they, they actually... Their first pass play completed over 20 yards in the U of O game was like with a minute left in the first half. And, and as much as it is about their offense, a lot of it really is what defenses have, have done to try to slow them down. They're really banking on them making mistakes, so they're playing a little bend, don't break, keep everything in front of them. Uh, and I have a feeling that's not necessarily going to be the uh, the mantra this week against Oregon State. <laughs> and obviously Oregon State gave up a couple of, their secondary gave up a couple of big plays last week, you know, and key, you talk about, you know, on that first drive on third down, the big long ball. Um, but generally speaking, they have some players there that, uh, you know, if they perform and get in position, they can, that's one of the areas where they're strongest. I was basically hoping this week, don't analyze Washington State. Don't sit there and try to memorize their route combinations and all their formations. They got to look at themselves and just make sure that you're aligned right and you know your assignment and you're just in the right place. Because last week, 
it was just a bunch of blown coverages, a bunch of mental mistakes that can't happen. If you're just in the right place, you can prepare yourself to make that play, you, get, you got a chance. And we have a chance how many times they're going to throw the ball to get some picks this, this game. Oh, no doubt. I mean, Kalani Sataki talked about it. Like, dude, I can't dumb this down for you anymore. <laughs> so if you can't figure this out, I got to get you off the field. And really, the same issue is happening down in Eugene. I mean, literally, I've watched Don Pelham call man defense for like 12 straight plays. And when they blew it, I mean, I was like, you got to be like pulling your hair out. Like, I can't cover that guy. I can't make it any simpler for you than that. And Kalani's even been saying, I'm yelling out the sidelines. I don't care that the team hears me. I'm yelling out, do you this. Got him. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, that, I mean, that's what's so, I, I, that's what's so aggravating too from the fan is when you hear, you know, when you hear Sataki talk about stuff like that, it's like, they're, they can't even get even the right position and where they're supposed like how does that well, happen? Well, some, sometimes level? it's because you got once again young guys still playing high school football at the Pac-12 level and so when I was in high school I was bigger I was faster than everybody I could stare at the quarterback he was a little five foot six guy who could barely throw the ball 35 yards down the field I looked at him when he was looking that way he never looked off I ran I picked it in college they look people off there's an invention called the pump fake you got guys who run slow go route. They'll do different things that a lot of guys just haven't seen yet. And no matter how much you tell them, right? We're all we're parents, not you yet, thank God, right? <laughs> but you know, you World's can tell them a million that. times, so you're blue in the face. But sometimes they just have you to. You mean go through your it kids themselves. don't listen to every single thing you say? <laughs> Jace, you better listen. To <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. Well, we still have a lot more to come. Of course, later on the show, we will talk about. Just a crazy football week across the country, and we will talk about the Steve and Steve situation from coast to coast. But coming up next, it is Burton's Breakdown. Nigel is going to fill us on on some of the key things to look for against Washington State. Oregon State's game tomorrow at Washington State, a game that they... Well, they're all must-wins, as Nigel says, but this one particularly feels like a must-win if we're going to get this season going. Hey, a Beaver moment in the NFL last night. Game between the Saints and the Falcons and Teron Ward and Brandon Cooks exchanging a moment afterwards, changing jerseys there, and you can tell Brandon's smiling. <laughs> Ward isn't, and it's because the Saints won the game. <laughs> 31 to 21 to hand the Falcons their first loss of the season. All right, so... That explains the expressions. Well, it is time for Burton's Breakdown, brought to you by Standard TV and Appliance, setting the standards since 1947. Nigel, what do you have tonight? Well, one, I love the fact that we showed some old, some beavers on the field there on Thursday night. And really, the best part is both of the, the, of the corners that should be starting, right, for the New Orleans Saints, both were beavers. Both played for me in, in uh, Brandon Browner and Keenan Lewis. Uh, you know, both of them starting making this big money. I've yet to get any donation. No, no kickback? Yeah, Coach Burton. Yeah, retirement fund, zero dollars back. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. Anyway, so what I want to do is talk a little DB play. So, you know, we talked about Washington State's defense, or excuse me, their offense, and how much Luke Falk has been patient, dink and dunk football, doing everything right. But if you give him the ability, to take advantage of the deep ball, he'll absolutely do it. Let's go to the In Focus Mondo Pad, collaboration that works, see what we're talking about. Now here, against Oregon, third and nine, down by three, late in the third quarter. At this point in the game, they had only completed one deep ball over 20 yards. But have no fear, Luke Falk is here, steps up in the pocket, throws the ball deep on the sideline, perfectly over the outside shoulder to Gabe Marks, one of the best wide receivers in the Pac-12 conference and they are absolutely licking their chops because our problem was early on in the game first quarter 1345 left still in it 0-0 third and six there's a new Solomon looks right down the pipe looks off the safety and here is our problem our problem here is Slade back in the day when you played safety I can't believe we actually recruited you to play safety <laughs> at Oregon State but <laughs> One of the rules, if you're a young DB, you can't ever look for the ball if you're stacked by the wide receiver. Listen, that quarterback is not throwing the ball to you. He's throwing it to the wide receiver, and he's good at what he does. So Larry Scott is not in position to look for the ball. We used to call this, oh, crap position. You're stacked. You're beat. Oh, crap. I was in that a lot. Yeah. That's why he <laughs> played DA line, right? Is now you just play the hands of the wide receiver. And a lot of guys will be able to catch up because in order to make that catch, he's got to slow down to focus on that small point. I didn't pass anything in physics or physiological studies, but that's the one thing I figured out <laughs> is in order to focus on that small point, he, the receiver has to slow down. So you still have a chance. Larry Scott looks back. He's stacked. 
Big play for the Arizona Wildcats. So the thing that they've got to make sure that they do, and Washington State is absolutely wants to get some big plays out of their wide receivers this week down the field, is make sure that you're in perfect position to look for the ball before you actually do to give the Beavs a fighting chance. Collaboration that works. Thank you so much for pointing it out. <laughs> Hey, I just I read what they tell me. <laughs> All right. Well, we talk about, of course, the uh, secondary, but also the uh, the pass rush defense, a big focus coming into this game with Luke Falk, a quarterback, and the Beavers player. has talked about the matchup this week. The quarterback, he likes to throw it up. So whenever they throw it up, we just got to be able to make that play. You know, even if even if it's close coverage, the quarterback has a lot of uh, trust in his receiver. So we just got to be able to take that away from him and make the play on the ball. How much does it change and help when you have a vicious pass rush going after that quarterback and changing things for those receivers? Yeah, that'd also be another thing uh, with, the, with the pass rush we get from the uh, guys up front. They hit, probably hit the check down a lot more, so we'll have to uh, catch on to those early and make sure they're not running across the field free so we can give ourselves a chance to win the game. It's a little tougher to get a pass rush with the three-man front, but I think uh, this week the scheme's a little different running a four-man front a little bit more, helping us uh, be able to get back there, so we'll see how that goes. Jenny writes in, how important will the Beavers' pass rush defense be, Slade? That's a little uh, preview of one of my keys of the game at the end there. I think Ooh. it's going to be huge, and we need to do that with our base defense. We can't be blitzing these guys all the time because <laughs> they're going to read that, and he's going to see where we're coming from and pick us right apart. So we've got to get a rush with our guys up front. You know, I, I spent a lot of time studying this defense, and actually, Mike, I, I, I <laughs> the only thing on my resume that's good <laughs> is the fact that <laughs> that the worst offensive performance Mike Leach's offense ever had at Texas Tech was against our defense when I was the defense coordinator at Nevada. I spent the entire summer studying this defense, talked to a lot of guys, Mouse Davis, about the run and shoot. And the thing about this defense, that they or this offense, is what they want you to be in is a hard cover two that they recognize, be in a hard cover three that they recognize, or man. The thing that you want to do is kind of keep things gray. You know, so we used to call it key or palms defense where it's a little bit of man, but it's kind of cover two. And so what that does is creates enough indecision with the receivers and the quarterbacks that sometimes you can force those guys to make mistakes. And so, you know, that's that's going to be a big key. Uh, and, and, and the only way to do that stuff is not to blitz and to get that kind of pass rush that we're talking about. With how much you've studied this, I'm thinking you should be up at Washington State as a little consultant. Uh, you know... Kalani could have called me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. Well, when we come back, we will shine the spotlight on Seth Collins. Time to talk Oregon State's quarterback. Where is he in his development after the Arizona game? Glad to have you with us starting your weekend, getting ready for football tomorrow. When Jay Keith writes in, Seth Collins regressing or just a tough game against Arizona? You know, you're going to see this with a young guy, and this is really, I think, his first step back. I think each week he's made small improvements every single week until this week, and so now it's all, how does he respond? You know, 8 for 24 is never a game you want to have as a quarterback. Uh, but it's, it's all how he responds from that, what he can take, what he can learn from that. And I think this next week we'll see a, another better version of, of Seth all over again. There is no true freshman quarterback in the history of college football that had a game like that. Like a Rosen. Yeah, Rosen threw three picks, right, against BYU. Mm -hmm. uh, you had, I mean, uh, you got Jake Browning up at UW who did not have a stellar game against USC. The lucky thing was he's got a defense that's just playing out of their minds. So, I mean, it, it, you know, it, not just freshmen, human beings have, have days like this. I don't care who you are. Uh, so, you know, it happens, and, and you're right. It's going to be how's he bounce back? How's, you know, does he keep his confidence? And that's why, you know, you make sure you're very delicate with him on, you know, hey, here's the things you messed up, and uh, let's move on. But he's got to have health, though. Man, these guys have got to step up for him. They, they have to be able to, when he makes an errant throw, make the catch. Mm -hmm. He's got to feel like, you know what, I can just take a shot uh, you know, Villeman's covered. I don't care. I'll throw the back shoulder fade. I'll throw the jump ball, and my guy will come down with it. He's got to feel like that. Those guys have got to make plays to make him feel confident in doing that. In their defense, though, this last game was the first time that I really did see him miss some, just not throw to some wide open guys. They just missed some reads. Yeah. But that'll come. Yeah, it happens. One of those things last week was just, can we just put it away? 
Just put it away. Put, put it to bed. I'm ready to put that game away. And Done. Get on we'll tomorrow get and box. watch and say something. All right. What are you talking about? <laughs> Coming up still on the show, these guys will give you their keys to the game. Slate already gave you a little bit of a preview. But coming up next, what a wild week in college football. The resignation of Steve Spurrier and, well, the force outing of Steve Sarkeesian at USC. You're at a dinner party. Give me the top three living people you want there with you. Uh, Sheldon from Big Bang would be number one. Penny. Bill Belichick would be number two. I, I have, there's no, I can't answer that question. Let's see, uh, Jim Carrey. It's like a dare, Harry. It's a double dare. Yeah, okay, you're on. Would love to be on a fly in the wall for that dinner party. That is quite a collection <laughs> of guests a around the Sheldon table. Talks to Belichick about. Then you got Jim Carrey sitting there with asparagus <laughs> in his mouth. <laughs> <I mean. laughs> All right. Well, that was entertaining from Coach Anderson, but pretty serious stories in college football this week. A tough start to the week, and we had uh, starting on the West Coast with USC and the situation with Star Steve Sarkeesian, who, of course, after that situation back in August and then last Sunday, everything sort of came apart when uh, he was not out of practice midday. It ended up with him being put on an indefinite leave of absence and then the next day fired by athletic director Pat Hayden. Now, Nigel, this is somebody who you know very well. You go back with, what, 20, 20 plus years. Yeah. So, you know, a friend. Also, you've been a head coach. You understand the spotlights that's on you. What sort of struck you about this story or about what he's going through now? I mean, obviously, the whole thing was unfortunate. Uh, you know, the, the thing that, you know, He's obviously going to go through um, a lot worse things until they get better. Um, but really, the, the problem I had was just kind of how everything was reported as everything went down. The feeding frenzy around yeah, it? Yeah, it was, it was, a lot of it was just really unfair. You know, there was an L.A. Times article, and I tweeted about it. I think I called it Something we can't hogwash. say on TV. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I mean, it really was. I mean, it was. And I got a call about a month ago from a friend up in Seattle who said, hey, listen, you know, have you talked to Sark? You should call him because the LA Times is in Seattle and they're going to try to bury him whether they find anything or not. And I thought that was the job that they did. They tried to, they talked about an event in 2012 where, you know, it says he jumped up on a bar, drink in hand, and gave a speech to a dozen former players in 2012. I was at that event. He didn't jump up on the bar. He was addressing all of us as former players at Washington. And... He was probably the only sober guy there, to be honest with you, uh, as I stood there with a couple of my buddies who had had way too much that night. And all he did was he addressed us. It was awesome. It was a great speech. He got down, and he made sure he talked to everybody, and he left because he had the spring game the next day. And, uh, you know, there was another thing where they talked about, you know, he, he, you know a, a time when he had 83 beers and 12 shots. And then they mentioned at the very end, well, by the way, there were 40 people at the, you know, that, you know, were at the dinner. So on average, what they average? Two, Selective two, reporting. Yeah, yeah, two beers a, a each. So, you know, obviously he's got an issue that he is addressing. And and, and for for him to go through and, and for that program to go through the, what they went through is, is, uh, is really was surprising to me. But, uh, you know, the way that everybody jumped on and then blamed Pat Hayden and all that stuff was just nonsense. Well, I was going to say, I mean, you're at a school like USC where obviously spotlights even bigger than and then you had some situation in in August so you're on a zero tolerance policy there yeah, and, and I understand the decision that was made to let him go that made perfect sense but you know and I, I equated it to on, on my radio show on Thursday was you know it's like you know who hasn't been at a Christmas party where there was that one person who had too many drinks and when the night was over and the next day showed up did someone say, hey, by the way, now you're suspended for 10 days and you need to go to a rehab facility? I mean, you have trust in the people that work for you. And, and especially if that's the only time you really ever saw them like that. And so that was really the only time Pat Hayden had ever seen Sark like that. I've hung out with Sark 25 times and never once did I ever see, and we would have drinks and we would hang out and have a good time. Not one time do I ever remember him being out of control. So as this thing was kind of developing, it was shocking to me because I'm like, that's not even the guy that I know. Well, and so it was kind of the same. I'm, I'm assuming it was the same for Pat Hayden. And so to play Monday morning quarterback to me was, was unfair. On the decision. But, yes, that is a very unfortunate decision. And we remember, I mean, he is a person. He's going through a divorce, has a tough family situation going on. There's just a lot of factors in play. And so I think a lot of people are just hoping
hoping he gets the help he needs to get back on the sidelines someday. Yeah, no all right. about it. All right, well, on the other coast, on the East Coast, then, we have Steve Spurrier, who, after the latest loss to drop South Carolina to two and four, well, resigned. And he said, first of all, I'm resigning, not retiring. I doubt if I'll ever be a head coach again, but don't say I've retired completely. Who knows what will come in the future? You know the biggest thing I'm going to miss? is his fights with Bobby Bowden. <laughs> You're going yeah, back to good. Free Shoes University. But yeah. what, what I just want to sit there and listen to them talk back and forth. Yeah. And obviously he's an entertaining guy and you, you know, know yeah, him is, well. Yeah, this is for? Yeah, the two guys who... <laughs> <laughs> so I worked for Coach Spurrier in 1999 at the University of Florida and, uh, you know, I think I told my favorite story was when he mis uh, mistook my wife for a uh, one of the academic advisors <laughs> and he asked my wife, he says, you know, yeah, so, uh, you know, she was from, the, the other lady was from West Virginia. She's like, yeah, you know, how's the weather in West Virginia? My wife looks at Coach Spurrier, he's like, um, I don't know, I, I'm from Oregon. <laughs> he looks at her, he's like, well, how's the weather there? <laughs> it was like, I mean, he was the nicest guy, you know, and, uh, you know, the one thing I will say is, you know, there were all these things about, you know, thank you, Coach, and everything. I actually think he got a pass because I was shocked that he didn't receive more criticism. Well, I was going to say, the man was to ask him about. That I mean, was That was my point I was going to say. I love the guy. I think it's terrible. I had a, I had a blast working for, for him for a very short period of time. I was only with him for three months, but uh, I thought that was... Don't I would have never even contemplated. Now, I think he did it because he was trying to set up his next coach or something like that. But Do you think it was that or it's that he's only had one season under 500, his first season at Duke? I don't he know. He wants to keep I, that I just record. Know, I just know this. You tell your players all the time, never quit on me, don't quit on us, keep fighting. And, uh, I mean, in essence, really, that's what he did. And the thing that was really funny to me was here you, here's Sark getting blasted and he has a disease that he's getting treatment for and he's getting railed in the media. Meanwhile, you have a guy make a decision that basically quit on his team and it was like owed to Steve Spurrier, which I, I get it. And you he's know, still he's, I don't get it. The the no, no, no. I mean, he I was a, no, no, no. He was a great coach, but I didn't understand that no, the first guy I heard say anything about it was Jesse, Jesse Palmer, Palmer, who played for him and was actually there when I was there. Uh, and he was the first person who was kind of like, what the, he you know, what the heck? No, that that was what I was going to say. You, you just, how can you quit on your team? How can you quit? How can you do that mid-season? I just don't, I don't get, I don't know that there's any excuse other, other than being health related. I don't yeah. see how, I mean, if that's an option that you're thinking about before season, because he was after last season, then do it then. Yeah, I just, I just think that it's, it's, if there was ever a study done on how two different incidents get played in the media and how based on, you know, how they're reported, you know, how it gets received by the public, uh, I think those are two, I mean, you've got two polar reactions uh, on two things that it was, it was, an, it would be an interesting case study. But hey, I guess if you uh, can quit and still collect the rest of your $4 million salary, why not? Uh, well, a wild week, that's for sure. All right, when we come back, these guys are going to give you the keys to the game. I'm thinking I might know one that's on Nigel's list. Let's see if I'm right. I think I might. All right, this is the scene. Martin Stadium tomorrow. Oregon State, Washington State. The Cougars coming off that big emotional win at Austin Stadium. The Oregon State, well, looking for a much-needed Pac-12 win under Gary Anderson. Of course, we have you covered all week long, starting with Talking Beavers and Slade Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock and then Inside the Huddle with Coach Anderson on Thursdays. And we come to you every Friday night at 9 o'clock on Hashtag Beers Football. And then have you covered on game day with the game day crew starting at 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. All right, so the key, and you know what? Of course he would. Nigel is fooling me. Cool. Keys to the game. He's had one key that I think has been the same every week, and he mixed it up this week. Hey, in honor of baseball coming down to, you know, it's in October, I'm a to the curve. There we go. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, in terms of, you know, my three keys to the game, the, the most important thing to me, especially watching the game against, you know, with Oregon and Washington State, run the football. Uh, obviously, to take more pressure off of Seth Collins, like we've talked about throughout the uh, throughout the season, to stop Washington State's run game. And I know that sounds funny when you talk about the air raid offense, but when Mike Leach was at Texas Tech and they were their most successful was when they were able to run the football. They ran the ball for almost 10 yards a carry when you take out all Luke Falk's yards last week at Oregon, and obviously that turned out well. So stop them from running the ball, and then make them dink and dunk. 
Make sure that they don't have the long ball. No plays over 20 yards. Make them earn the way down the field, get some mistakes, get some tip balls, keep everything under control, and I think the Beavs have a great chance to win. And what did I, I like think it, was going to be on the list? Turnovers. turnovers. It's always about turnovers. It's always about turnovers. Katie, don't worry. Oh. I've got you. Okay. Boom. Fantastic. I'm listening to the coach now. <laughs> but first, finally. before we get to the turnovers, we got to get, I already said, the quarterback <laughs> pressure, finally. I. Luke Falk cannot sit back there all day long. He'll pick us apart. We have six sacks in the year. It's last in the conference. We've got to get better at that. Got to get in his face in those base packages. We don't have to send a lot of blitz to do that. Once we get all those sacks, then, Coach, the turnovers will come. I want a plus two turnover margin in this game. Luke Falk's only thrown two interceptions. He needs to make this the worst game of his season. And that'll lead us to... I don't care what they do in the middle of the field, our red zone defense has got to step up. Right now, we're 68% uh, TDs in our red zone. That can't happen. Back when I was playing, we were around 50. We've got to step up that in the red zone, bend but don't break defense, holding the field goals, we get the win. All right, there you have it. That's what needs to happen, of course. Beavers at Washington State tomorrow. We're going to be back here next Friday night to get you ready for the Colorado game. Next game at Reserve Stadium, but trying to pick up this win first. Want to point out, though, over the weekend, we got a former Look Beaver the in the World Series. Michael Conforto, part of the New York Mets. Look at from the Little League World Series. He was part of that. Then, of course, the World Series, College World Series with Oregon State. And now he's on the biggest stage at all of all playing for the Mets. So wish him with the, the chance best of for the luck. big time World Series. Exactly. Well, thanks for joining us and enjoy the game tomorrow. Go Beavers. We'll see you back here next week.